I'm Jason Husser. I'm an assistant professor of political science and policy studies. I also assistant director of the Elon Poll, and I'm here as faculty fellow for civic engagement. And thank you, um, each of you, for being here. This is Alamance 2030. What will our community be like in 15 years? And it's um, great to see so many community members and students, faculty, and staff here to talk about such an important issue. To give you some background context before I turn it over to questions from the audience to our panel, the goal of Community Connections is to create thoughtful dialogue with members of the university community and our broader community. Um, previous forums have explored issues surrounding health care, gun violence, education, and poverty. While we hope, uh, what we hope the audience takes away from this tonight is an understanding of where Alamance County is today and where it's going to move over the next 15 years, and enough perspective for us as individual citizens to know what can we do to help it move in the direction that we could collectively agree. Um, if this is your first time at one of our Community Connections forums, we hope that tonight's evening will be lively. Most of the evening will largely consist of Q&A between you, the audience, and our, our four great panelists tonight. Um, we are being filmed here today, so your questions will be on camera, and we will share a link on YouTube um, fairly widely for um, you to share with others who may be interested but not here. So we hope you'll share some of the, the insights from this evening with others. I'll go ahead and get started, make the most of our time, and introduce our panelists. Um, <laughs> first, I'll start with David Cheek. David is Mebane City Manager. It's a long, long history of um, working in the county, so thank you for being here. Um, April Durer. April is Director of Community Impact of the United Way of Alamance County. We also have Ryan Kirk. Ryan Kirk is Assistant Professor of Geography and Environmental Studies here at Elon. And we have Amy Nelson. Amy is Director of Planning and Economic Development for the City of Burlington. Each of our panelists brings um, a unique and valuable perspective, so we hope we have a variety of ideas going forward tonight. So now let's go into the distant future. Now, not, not like Star Trek distant, that's too far to actually do anything. Or like Justin Bieber and Taylor Swift are middle-aged distant. <laughs> uh, but before we go that far, it's, <laughs> it's gonna happen, isn't that scary? <laughs> Uh, so uh, before we go that far though, it's important to know where are we today. Um, I have a, a couple slides to start out with and then Dr. Kirk has a, a number of very helpful maps that he made to give us some context for tonight's discussion. The Elon University poll along with United Way, um, largely through April's liaison, conducts a survey every other year about um, what do citizens of Alamance County think about issues in the county. I'll show you three quick slides about what people in Alamance County had to say. So this is the first one about what's the most important issue in the county to residents of the county. I won't go through all the details, but you see a few patterns emerge here. We also asked them, what's the best thing about living in Alamance County? That seems like an important thing to know. A lot of it has to do with we're the right size, we're the right location. But what's the worst thing about living in the county as well? Some of these themes and patterns aren't a surprise to you. Dr. Kirk has um, far more interesting information to share. <laughs> All right, so I need to walk around so I can actually see the slides to talk about here. <laughs> I'll come to the other side. So uh, eight simple slides to give us context about recent trends uh, uh, in the growth of the county and some of the forecasts looking forward over the next 15 years. Uh, the first two slides are uh, demographic projections from the state of North Carolina, uh, summarized in a, uh, a couple of different ways. First, by age groups. Um, current forecast through 2030 uh, uh, predicts a slight decline in the number of our youth population under 18. A modest growth in the 18 to 34 age groups are young working age. Although, in my opinion, this sort of contradicts some of other evidence of recent trends that there's been a slight drop in that young working age group in the county. Uh, um, some slight growth in the, the um, older of the, the working age group, and then the senior population is where we're expected to see the largest growth in this county. So a change in the demographic in this regard. Um, in terms of uh, uh, race, the, the state does not break it up into too many uh, different ethnic groups, but we can uh, show uh, modest growth in white population, and then the non-white population is expected to grow at a higher rate, uh, a mixture of African-American and Hispanic populations. 
Um, here is a map showing recent trends. The next few slides show some recent trends in development patterns and uh, uh, others in the county. Um, this one shows where new buildings are being placed in the county uh, on a continuum from urban all the way to rural. Uh, urban, uh, the most dense, over 250 buildings in a square kilometer. Suburban, 25 to 250. Ex-urban is sort of that beyond the suburban fringe, but not quite rural. Uh, and then the rural would be the yellow on the outside. Uh, growth since 1990, uh, um, there was a trend, 70s, 80s, and 90s, throughout North Carolina and the southeast of uh, heavy ex-urban growth. So these would be the lots where you'd have two to five acres, uh, larger developments, not quite farm size, but a little bit bigger. Seeing a decline in recent years of ex-urban uh, uh, building, a uh, decline in rural building, the real growth story has been at suburban densities. So this is kind of the trend uh, um, forecasted for that to continue uh, suburban density development uh, throughout the county. Uh, um, recent trends in migration. So this is the American Community Survey uh, over the uh, past five years up through 2012, uh, as the most recent they have published. Uh, um, uh, in the top, it shows the annual average migration over this period, showing that we do have a net in migration uh, into the county uh, by an average of 950 people uh, per year. Um, here shows the counties around the U.S., so it's not international migration, the counties around the U.S. where 10 or more people migrated into Alamance County. It's a lot of support, some of the anecdotal evidence of a large migration from some of the northeastern states and then a scattering beyond that. All right, the next four slides just give us some context uh, of some of the key terms when we think about planning in uh, Alamance County's future. Uh, uh, all of these really establish that we are not an island isolated from our broader community. Um, this slide is the commuting pattern. Show that in terms of our job employment, we provide workers that go to Greensboro, go to the triad uh, in the triangle, but we also bring a lot of people in. Uh, Burlington, I know, is a net uh, commuter. People coming, more people come into Burlington to work uh, than leave to other counties. So we're intimately connected with our neighbors. All right, three concepts uh, uh, in terms of regional planning that we hear. Uh, the Alamance Chamber, Chamber of Commerce and others have been really promoting this idea of a Carolina corridor, so we hear about that. Uh, they frame this as Burlington and Alamance County being a connection between the triangle to the east and the triad to the west. So these two important growth areas in North Carolina, and, and, and we are in the middle of them provides a real opportunity, uh, but also provides some competitive challenges within this Carolina corridor. Next way to define our region is we are part of the Piedmont Triad, uh, most often associated uh, with the triad rather than the triangle. Although as we'll hear, Mevin might have closer links to the triangle there. Uh, um, forecasting for this region is that we are a growth area, uh, uh, and then you can see sort of our corridor along I-40 is predicted to continue to grow. Very last slide, scaling it up even larger. There's a big move in planning community to talk about large scale regional planning to the point of mega regions. So here's a national uh, think tank uh, um, pulls together this idea of we're gonna have several large regions. Uh, Alamance County is in the northern edge of the Piedmont Atlantic mega region. So this is one that Pat McCrory has been involved with this idea that we need to scale planning up because these are connected economies and connected growth areas. All right, that's <laughs> our context. Thank you, Ryan. So those are the numbers, and, and Ryan does a great job showing you some of the broader quantitative trends. Um, <clears throat> but we have a wealth of qualitative information that folks have accumulated from um, years of experience here. The floor is open to each of you in the audience to come forward and ask a question. We have mics on each side of the aisle. I have questions if you don't, but, but mainly we want to hear what do people in the community want to know about the future of Alamance County? So if anybody would like to come forward. All right, well, I'll start out then <laughs> while, while people are thinking about it. Think up some good questions. But to, to start out, um, one of the real driving uh, factors in us having this event, this notion of downtown Burlington revitalization. So this really is, is for you, Amy. Um, as the center of the biggest municipality of the county, um, downtown Burlington, it clearly plays a vital role in the future of the broader community. What are some things happening now in, in efforts um, of downtown Burlington revitalization and planning? 
Well, we have um, a downtown group that helps to guide the growth in the city uh, as far as the downtown goes. They, uh, they're doing a really good job. I'm on that board, but I'm not speaking necessarily for myself. Um, there's been a lot of growth lately. There's a lot of events. We have the Fourth Fridays that have been very popular, and they're continuing to grow. Um, I would encourage you to come out if you haven't been to any of them. It's, it's really a wonderful event. Lots of really good music and good food. Um, it's a good way to spend your Fridays. But um, there are several other events, uh, Active City Streets. Um, they're working closely with our Parks and Recreation Department and putting on those events and scheduling and trying to make downtown better and, and busier. And uh, if you've been downtown lately, if you've been to the old historic depot and you just turn around and look across the street at Front Street, you'll see the new activity. The old jewelry store has been torn down and there's a new building going up in its place. That entire block is being revitalized. There's a new um, coffee, tea, and smoothie shop that's opening up on the corner. Um, it's, it's very exciting. They're going to have some loft apartments, some office space, and retail in addition to the restaurants and uh, some outdoor dining as well. So downtown is really starting to grow. I know you've heard about um, LabCorp leaving a lot of their, um, their spaces behind when they're moving out in the near future. We don't know exactly when, but um, we have high hopes that those buildings from the interest that's, that I've heard of in developers looking at our downtown, um, that those will turn over into maybe some more apartments, get some more people living downtown, because that's the, the key in turning any downtown around, getting some people to live downtown, and then that brings in more restaurants and more retail, and then more people come to visit, and more people start to move in, and it really starts to, to liven up, and it's, it's already started. I told someone uh, last weekend that if I, had, if I had the money, this is a really good time to buy a building downtown Burlington. And five or 10 years, your money's gonna be tripled. I can just see it. It's really, really growing fast. Yeah, along those lines with LabCorp, this is for, for all of you, we often think about um, regions in terms of their one major economic sector. So Silicon Valley is an easy example of that. Um, here in North Carolina, we think of the Research Triangle and healthcare-related services. What sort of industries or economic sectors are we really looking at as, in terms of emphasizing growth over the long term in the county? Some of that I know is secret because of these local economic <laughs> development efforts, but do you see any certain areas where, we're well, where, where we are well positioned to grow? Uh, right now in, in Mebane and I think across the county, um, distribution is a, a big uh, growth area for the county. Uh, it helps when you have eight lanes of highway running through that splits into two more eight lane highways uh, about 15 miles down the road uh, where 40 and 85 split. But, Distribution has been really big. Um, in Mebbin, we've been trying to attract uh, some of the higher paying jobs. Uh, and we've, we've, come, we've come in second twice on pharmaceutical industries, but they continue to locate in Durham, the Research Triangle area. Uh, and there's various reasons for that. Um, they don't always tell us, but the last one we lost actually wrote us a letter and told us how good we did <laughs> in the economic development hunt for them so um, uh, I could I could say a few more things about why maybe they chose Orange and and Durham County over over Alamance but maybe later well, okay, great. If, if I can say oh please um, I've been told by our consultants they, they pointed it out for us with our comprehensive plan and it's it's easy enough to see if you look at it and think about it yourself the triangle and the triad regions are growing rapidly, especially the triangle. However, there's a limited amount of space for all those people and all those businesses. So it's just naturally gonna to start to spill over and after it gets past Orange County, we're next. So the future is wide open as far as I'm concerned. Um, this is a question I was thinking of with you, Ryan, but if anybody else has insights, please let me know. 
you know, there's a, um, one wacky story, I like wacky stories, but one wacky story that, that led us to sort of thinking about this panel was this um, news item about the growth of cockroaches um, along the Carolina corridor. So we think of the Carolina corridor, we don't want to think of as the cockroach corridor. So all of this uh, economic change does have some environmental consequence, for the better or for worse. Um, what are some environmental trends we should be thinking about as the county moves forward over the next 15 years? Um, I think the most remarkable trend I've seen in Alamance and regional counties has been this idea of green space growth. Um, also on this board, the Burlington Comprehensive Planning. I uh, see this at the, the Piedmont Triad level, seeing it at the county level, I'm on the Alamance County Park Board. Uh, this idea that we need to increase our, our connectivity of greenways for recreation purposes, but also for water quality protection. So those are the two I've seen the most buzz about. And we have uh, begun work on our Green Waves master plan for the city of Burlington. We want to try to connect up with the county and, and by extension with, with Mevin and, and Graham and, and make it so people can walk and animals can travel and water can be protected and keep some green space out there. I'm sure there's some challenges with that at a local government level when green space sounds great, and it is great, but when folks like you have to put the logistics in place, um, but, and Alamance County does have some regional leaders. I know the uh, Alamance County Park and the, uh, the Hall River Trail development uh, has been a real spark in this county that's gotten a lot of attention, I think, statewide and probably regionally. Any audience questions? Well, I have a question. Uh, we have a floor mic. If, uh... <laughs> So there was uh, on a couple of those previous slides, you know, some of the major issues, and we see it in the paper, jobs and economy and that kind of thing. I'm curious as to, in some of the feedback, when you're looking at trying to entice some of these uh, high-end businesses, high-end paying jobs, um, how often does the educated workforce, and I noticed that some of the statistics in the thing, uh, there's only 21% of the population over 25 with a bachelor's degree and higher in the population of this county. Uh, have you seen that kind of problem with uh, people, uh, uh, positions in high-tech industries that come in and say that we don't think that we can attract a, a high enough educated workforce from either what we have here or from outside? Well, I'll, uh, I'll take a stab at that one. Uh, one of the pharmaceutical companies uh, specifically mentioned uh, our education system here in the county. Uh, one, of the, one of the unfortunate things is we live beside Orange County. Orange County is the highest funded locally education system in the state. Alamance is not. It's, it's funded less. Um, Orange County also has the highest tax rate in the state of North Carolina. Alamance County does not. They have one of the lowest tax rates in Alamance County. So when you have the Research Triangle, Durham, Traburn Park sitting 25 miles to your left and you're trying to attract a company that has high paying jobs, they take a look at the school systems and they weigh that. I will tell you our incentive package was much better than Orange County's or Durham County's, but we lost. I'm not saying that's the only factor, but it was a factor because they mentioned it. Any other, um, Bob, do you have a, a question? I was curious um, about your thoughts on the role of uh, public transportation on economic development, both from um, just a local issue and as part of a regional issue. Whoever wants to go. <laughs> well, I guess I'll chime in on that one. I think probably that's the number one issue holding back this community. Um, when, when Jason and I were talking a little bit earlier today, I said, you know, thinking ahead, if we don't look at basic infrastructure like public transportation, we're really holding back our community from moving forward in more ways than one. And that might be from an education standpoint, a job standpoint, an environmental standpoint, a health standpoint. and. Burlington is the largest city in the state without that infrastructure, and while they're making strides to move forward with that, 
Um, it's certainly something of importance that we hear time and time again at United Way from our grantees and those that they serve. Sometimes that, that ride is the thing that stops them from the job, from the medical appointment, from accessing healthy foods, from getting to a recreational facility. And so certainly that's something we hear often and we fund uh, quite a bit of programs that rely on that money for public transportation. So certainly something to look forward to in the future. Well, I'm, um, in Mevin, I was riding into work the other day, pulled into City Hall and there's a full-size bus in front of City Hall <laughs> and there's two people waiting to get on it. I, I could, I mean, it was just stunning to me. It just started two weeks ago, Triangle Transit and Piedmont Area Regional Transportation have collaborated together to, for a commuter route to Durham and Chapel Hill, back up to Winston-Salem and Greensboro. They go by Alamance Community College, uh, and people are riding the bus. Um, I, you know, I was skeptical at first, but uh, when you're coming down Fifth Street, which is one of the main drags in, in Mebane, and you see a full-size bus coming at you, it just <laughs> sort of takes your breath away. <laughs> but it's really, it's, it's pretty exciting. Uh, especially because we're not really having to pay for it. Uh, Triangle Transit's paying for it and CART is. I mean, we're paying for it indirectly, but we didn't have to make a direct appropriation with, from city government. So, uh, and I will tell you, we are getting emails from people saying, thank you so much for the bus system. I mean, my daughter's a nurse uh, at Chapel Hill. She pays $600 or more a year to park five miles away from the hospital and take another bus in to get to work. So I've got five people in my neighborhood that work at, in Durham and at medical centers down there. They're, they're starting to talk about using these buses. So they are very viable means of transportation. What are some impediments to transportation? <clears throat> Not just in Alamance County, but, but writ large in communities in terms of putting these transportation infrastructures in place. If obviously if they were easy to do, you would have done it already. It, it does take a lot of work, um, a lot of planning. We've been um, discussing this in Burlington since way before I came to Burlington. And they've made the decision now, and we are working towards that. It's a lot of groundwork that has to be laid. Um, you'd be really surprised at how much work there is to setting this up. The, uh, the morning after we had our vote, um, someone called the planning department and asked where they could buy their ticket so they could start riding the bus tomorrow. And we had to explain to her that it takes a while to get the buses on order after you've decided on everything that you need for those buses and where they're gonna run. You have to make decisions on all those factors before you can even order the buses and get them in and then hire a company to come in and run the buses for you. So it, it's, it's a lot of work, it's a long process and it, it takes a long time. So hopefully, hopefully next year, <coughs> hopefully in the spring, but don't hold me to that. <laughs> We have a question from the floor. If I may, I'd like to respond to the previous discussion about the Research Triangle Park. I lived and worked there for over 30 years. We had a saying of come to work and bring your own desk. We had to purchase our parking stickers. It had to be a lottery type arrangement with various departments deciding uh, whether the people who lived the farthest away got the parking stickers or the people who'd worked there the longest got the parking stickers. Um, we finally got to where we had a, a bus system around campus. If you wanted to go to a meeting, you had to call and arrange to ride and go out, but you better be early because they might be a little bit early and they'd leave you. And, <laughs> If you got on the bus and then you, you got to the closest bus stop and you got off and you walked to your reading, it took a tremendous amount of time. I guess what I'm trying to say is be careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good follow-up question. Ryan, you may have some insights in that with... Uh, <laughs> Not to put you on the spot, but with population change, obviously we have more buildings, and more buildings lead to less space for something else. Um, do you expect for major traffic changes in the county over the next 15 years? I, any more insights? I can only speculate. 
I like speculation. <laughs> <laughs> I do it all the time. Uh, I mean, the only plans I've seen, there are uh, some uh, north-south roads in Mabin, uh, been in the works for many years. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Yeah, uh, North Carolina 119, uh, it's a 20-year project so far. Uh, they actually, I've gotten word that they've started buying right away for it. So I think in the next 10 to 15 years, we'll have a road in. Uh, but that will be a, a major north-south corridor. Um, I live in the northern part of Mebane. It takes me about 10 to 15 minutes from the highway. It's not that far, but Mebane's, mm -hmm. it takes a while to get through it. If they put that in, I'll be home in five minutes. So if that happens, uh, Mebane will see a lot of population, I think, housing up in the northern part of the city and, and further out. It, it sounds like a long time, but it's even, it's even longer than 20 years. Um, someone could start out their career as a transportation planner and work on this idea of a road somewhere, and by the time they're ready to retire in 30 years or so, they'll be lucky if that road is starting to be built. It takes a very long time. It's a long process. And after they get the, the planning part set, there's all kinds of public meetings and trying to work around um, things such as historic sites, cemeteries, um, environmental issues, water, um, endangered species, anything like that. Um, and it takes years just to get that planning part through. And then, of course, there's trying to find the money especially the way the government's working today with so little income coming in from the, the tax revenues for, t for transit and uh, transportation issues. You have to try to parcel out that money as fairly as possible, and then you have to try to gather up money to pay for the new road in segments. Um, buying the right of way is, is a good step, and then you're going to have to have money to fund the construction of that, of that road, and it may be in, in pieces, like 119 is in pieces. And, and it just should show the continued importance of the interstate corridor. Uh, a lot of economic development initiatives that I'm familiar with uh, all in proximity to the interstate. So moving away from the interstate, the challenges only increase, clearly. Do we have any other audience questions? Yes, sir. You mentioned local transportation challenges such as parking at Elon, as well as regional ones such as commuting to and from the triad and the triangle areas. And as an Elon college student, I feel that it would be valuable to consider putting an Elon train stop because there are already six passenger trains that pass through Elon a day. There's many faculty that commute from places already along the um, Piedmont Carolinian passenger rail corridors, and there is a lot of growth at Elon. So I was just wondering what your thoughts on that idea of putting a train stop at Elon would be, please. Well, uh, I don't like it. <laughs> 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 I want a train stop in Mevin. <laughs> <laughs> I would like the train to not go through during graduation events. <laughs> yes, sir. And that's another one, though, with the, the planning logistics for a movie like that. Uh, Tremendous. Heard, heard the story of what it took to get a tunnel, a walking tunnel underneath for our own students. How was that a 10-year process or something? Mm -hmm. So an, another bureaucratic uh, great challenge. Hi, I'm Ben Harris with the Alamance Makers Guild and the Burlington Mini Maker Fair. And I have kind of a combination question statement. So out of curiosity, the folks on the panel and also just by raise of hands in the room, how many people in here are aware that Burlington is one of the first four cities in the state to be recognized by the White House as a maker city? Okay, a few hands went up. <laughs> so the maker movement kind of addresses some of the questions we had earlier with um, the, uh, the two top things on the chart were jobs and education. And jobs relates to manufacturing, but that doesn't have to be big manufacturing. That can be cottage industry, too. Another issue we see is our youth leaving. You know, we see a decline in our youth. So what's going to happen over time? What's going to happen in the next 30 years after 2030 when Justin Bieber's with his walker? 
<laughs> so we're working hard to establish a lot of things in the community. I'm, I know what we're doing with Burlington. What are other communities in Alamance County doing around the maker movement? And before you answer that, we are hosting a event at Holly Home Mall on March 4th that's gonna be a local maker roundtable. We're gonna be inviting people from all over the county uh, in government, in the library system, school system, you name it, small businesses, and it's open to the public as well. That'll be March 4th at 2 p.m. Uh, and we have the Burlington Mini Maker Fair coming up April 25th. We bring 4,000 people into that last year. We're hoping to double that this year. Half of them are from outside the county. So what can we also do so that that day is Maker Day in the county and we bring people in and they go eat lunch and they spend money and they stay at a hotel room and they do other things while they're in our community. So. For the audience, what a maker space okay. is. Okay, so a maker spe So what's a maker? A maker is anybody that makes things. That's nothing new. But there's a whole community that's grown up around it nationwide. This has started around the year 2000. It actually started out of Germany with the idea of a maker space. If you live in an apartment in a city, you don't have a garage or a workshop for your table saw. You don't have an electronics lab in your apartment to burn it down. You don't have a lab to do science experiments. So people got together, pooled their money, bought a place, put tools in it, and started makerspaces, community workshops. And from that came an appreciation. This is sort of the rise of the geeks. If you've heard of 3D printers, you've heard of all of these new technologies that bring us together. At the same time, the internet and social media came along. So I can have a project and ask a question of someone in Japan or Russia or England or down the street that I didn't know was also working on the same thing that I was working on. And what we found is that's great, but you need physical community too. People need to come together. And as I've seen articles about things like Lions Club and Rotary and things like that that are traditional declining as people age out and youth aren't coming in, we've seen a huge expanse. We have people coming to our Makers Guild meetings from you know kids coming with parents, seven-year-old, all the way up to very wise retirees that want to be mentors, and it's a great opportunity for community. So it's all around art, it's all around science, it's all around putting things together. And people are creating businesses, MakerBot Industries. Two guys started in their, uh, in their apartment in New York, and five years later, they were a $600 million company. That could happen in Burlington. We have people here doing amazing things that you just don't realize because we're disconnected from them. Could you just repeat the question for the um, panelists? So what are the other cities in Alamance County doing, and what are we planning in terms of becoming a maker community between now and 2030? It's okay if you don't know, because <laughs> I don't. I don't know if I've thought about that one. Okay, well, you can oh, talk to me later, because we have a lot of plans. <laughs> I don't know if this answers directly, but um, I, I applaud. The Maker Community is my favorite new community building program I've heard about in Alamance <laughs> County. And, and, and I hope some of the questions and discussions about what's our culture going to be like in 2030 and community building initiatives like this uh, are fantastic. Uh, I love going to Holly Hill Mall and seeing the enthusiasm from all segments of society. So I applaud your efforts. <laughs> Thank you. And there's well, a space in Holly Hill. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, and we're very happy that y'all are in Burlington. Um, it's, it's a great movement. It's growing. I know last year um, when you had the event, there was a makeup day for school, so we missed it. But we were driving past the mall and saw the balloon launch. My son thought somebody's balloon got away from some kid's balloon, so he felt bad. And then when I went to one of your events, I found out that there was a camera on there. And that was just amazing to me. I told my kids about that. So not to hog the mic, but I have to say one quick thing. Big shout out for Blessed Sacrament School of Burlington. We've been working with them. Uh, they're the, one of the state's first 12 STEM schools of distinction, so another proud thing for Burlington. They're the first and only private school to have that. And at this year's Maker Faire, it, the, last, the one you saw was adults. It was a group out of Raleigh. Actually, it's meteorologists from Channel 5 that do weather balloons in their spare time for fun. But this year, the kids of Blessed Sacrament School are designing, building, and launching a near space mission of their own with two balloons, hydrogen fuel for renewability, and they're gonna have parents as chase crews, and we're gonna be doing really awesome things with that. So we're launching a space mission out of Burlington. How cool is that? <laughs> this reminds me of a quote by a, a very prominent venture capitalist who was asked, how do you create the next Silicon Valley? He said, you need two ingredients, a university and nerds. <laughs> I know some nerds. And I mean nerds. that the, the best I can is one of them. Thank you. Next question. 
I just want to add to that. I'm Eric Henry. I've had the opportunity to live in this community over 50 years. I experienced firsthand the destruction that NAFTA did to this community. And hopefully I learned from that experience. Because pre-NAFTA, this was a booming community. Elon was a lot smaller then, but I saw our community get destroyed. I saw our downtown get destroyed. Not only by the globalization of NAFTA, but the infusion of the big box stores. Because probably tonight, I doubt that is being represented tonight. So what I encourage us to do as we look towards the future is invest in your community, just like we are talking about with the Maker's Mark. The answer is not outside. The answer is here. The answer is in this room. The answer is in the people that live in this community. I've had an opportunity to travel around this country a lot. There's an organization I'm a member called Bali, Business Alliance for Local Living Economies. And what they have determined, when you spend money at a locally owned store, that dollar bounces seven times before it leaves your community. Compared to if you go to a big box store, it's one stop and gone. The investment doesn't stay here. Look no further than what has happened in Saxby Hall. That was a thriving textile community, devastated by NAFTA, and has been totally revitalized. Probably 50 or 60 people work down there. They made the connection to local food. So again, I encourage what we have at Elon University, but let's don't make that mistake again. The answer is here not there. So as we look forward, the solution is not there but here. Thank you so much. Along those lines, a question that I got from folks as I was walking around um, campus today asking, what should I ask this panel? Um, one was, what does it take to get more local restaurants, uh, more local retail stores? Have, have some communities done, you know, if you, the town of Elon's doing pretty well with local restaurants. We have alums running restaurants in town, former staff members uh, running a coffee shop and bar. It, is there some sort of secret to getting places like the Eddie? Well, I always tell our Elon interns and volunteers and students, we need you to stay here after you graduate, like I did, instead yeah. of move away. <laughs> and perhaps then we'll have more uh, millennials choosing to invest in our communities. And I think, you know, this kind of ties, I think this question ties a lot of the issues we've been talking about tonight together because millennials are looking for those communities that are walkable, that have transit, that have things that are within the central downtown where you can live, work, and do recreational activities all within that same space. So if we can do a better job of keeping Elon graduates here, maybe by creating those opportunities, that will help, I think. But. Any other thoughts on that? Somebody who may have an idea about local business? Well, <laughs> I, I'll, I recommend the uh, orzo salad at Pandora's. It's wonderful tonight. <laughs> that. <laughs> really, really good for that, too. And Jason, first of all, thank Elon University for putting this on. I think it's great for working well, in the community. You. I have two sons that are in college, and talking to their teachers, especially in high school, the thing that kind of blew my mind is like, we're trying to educate young folks for jobs 10 years from now. We don't know what they're going to be. Right. And scary to me a too. A huge percentage of new jobs in the future that, again, 60% of the jobs in the future, we don't know what they're going to be. So my question is, how can municipalities be ready and what kind of strategic thinking are municipalities doing to think, what will the future hold? What things do we need to put in place so that when we can be agile enough for when that next big thing comes, we have that in place? Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking the other way on this one. <laughs> that was softball day. Was it? Felt like a fastball to me. Um, well, I will, I will say this. Um, I, I've spent a little time in uh, downtown Durham, and I don't know if you a lot of you might not remember downtown Durham, but it's changed dramatically. And the American tobacco warehouses, much like white furniture in Mebane, uh, and it's revitalized. They're building apartments in Durham as fast as they can. Um, so my thoughts to attract that type of worker that you're talking about, Marty, are to create a community that people want to live in that would have sidewalks and greenways that they can get out 
and get some fresh air and think. In fact, white furniture is currently being renovated. It's gonna be 157 apartments, but originally, and, and, and by the way, it's being renovated by the guy that did American Tobacco. Mm -hmm. um, he wanted to put 10,000 square feet of, I'll call it tonight, maker space, where people come together, they use the same copier, they may use the same bandsaw, but it was 10,000 square feet. Only problem is he wanted the city to pay the rent on it for 10 years, and we weren't willing to do that. But um, I say that to say, I think you create communities where these people want to live. Uh, if you go to downtown Durham now, you will see millennials mm -hmm. all over the place, and they're walking on the sidewalks, they're hanging out in the parks, and they're going back to their apartments because they want to live near it. And then they go to this, it's just open space, and they hang out together and come up with these ideas, mm -hmm and then they're multimillionaires uh, in a few years. So it's really easy, apparently, but. but and, hopefully <laughs> donate back, and hopefully donate back to their university. <laughs> That's right. Well, that, that is the key, um, as I believe. Um, I've been doing a lot of research in economic development lately, and, and that's the key as far as the, the field goes. Um, they all say what, what you want to do to be a successful community and attract people to live in your community is make it a place that's enjoyable to live in. And not only will you attract the residents, but the businesses will start to come as well to where their employees are located. So you work on your parks and your, your sidewalks and your programming and try to make it as, as wonderful a place you, as you possibly can, and then that attracts the people and hopefully jobs will follow. Another question? Yes. Uh, I'm a current Elon student here from California, and one of the things I was a bit surprised to find out is how big of an issue food insecurity is around uh, the Burlington community and the Alamance County overall. And I was wondering what measures were being done currently to address that issue and what the future looks for those nearly one in four children who live in food insecure homes. April. Okay, they're all looking at me, so I guess that's my question. That's all you. <laughs> and I think actually he's talking about the next topic. Is, is that right? So you're jumping ahead to the next dialogue, but. We'll do a little tidbit on, on hunger. So in Alamance County, that is certainly an issue, as well as affordable housing and other basic needs. And that's one thing United Way strives to close the gap on. And unfortunately, there was a large provider, Loaves and Fishes, you all probably heard, that had closed um, suddenly. And so the community really had to come together and solve problems and step up. And luckily, allied churches offered to open a food pantry when they were no were not offering a food pantry before. They were offering meals and housing, and so that was one way um, the community stepped forward. There's certainly lots of other food pantry initiatives through churches, other organizations, and food drives and things of that nature, but certainly the awareness about hunger and the awareness about healthy foods and how um, folks that are struggling with, with hunger also need to make sure they're eating a balanced diet, and when we do drives, making sure those things are available is certainly something that's being discussed in the community and it's a great question it's a hard question because there's not really an answer that that solves it it kind of comes back to this bigger picture where we're looking at income we're looking at education we're looking at jobs and how all of these things are really the formula to a healthy successful life so certainly something to um continue at the next one, I'll say. <laughs> yeah. So on March 31st, in this very room at 7 o'clock, um, we will have another one of these forums dedicated to hunger in Alamance County. So that's my plug. And I have another plug that somebody asked me to make related to that. So Hope, Helping Other People Eat, is hosting their annual fundraiser um, in two weeks, about roughly, on February 26th um, at Alamance Country Club. So if you're interested in that, Alexandra, uh, did I say that correctly? It, mm -hmm. it has more information available. Uh, kind of a transition question between uh, the technology and everything like that. We have mentioned uh, small tech companies coming in, you know, the maker movement, and also pharmaceuticals and the research triangle was mentioned heavily. Uh, I'm kind of curious and calling Eric Henry here because I've seen what he's done with the community and um, you know, the movement of manufacturing out of the county, how is that going to come back in and how is that going to affect 
um, both the urban areas, because I know there's quite a few factories shut down in uh, Burlington area that you know may go one of two different ways. Um, and then also, how is that going to displace the agricultural community in the county? Great question. Maybe we should let Eric Henry answer it. <laughs> Glad to jump into. I mean, I think the agriculture community is a, is a, a very valuable asset that we are missing. Uh, connecting that food, supporting the farmers in our community, people that pay taxes in the community. And I was only in April before she got started the local food policy council, and we kind of got delayed because somebody fired her. And, uh, we get the fire back up. I wouldn't say that would be the reason. I'd say we also need um, support from our elected officials, which we have several of them yeah. here tonight, which speaks volumes to when you're talking about these big picture things such as policy and government and how we need to probably address those bigger picture issues, whether it's food, whether it's housing, whether it's transit, all of those things together. And just a, a real quick story reminds me, in the, in the throes of the recession, 2008, 2009, they have this thing, State of Alamance County, and all the big business leaders go and stuff like there. And this discussion was, what are we going to do to get jobs? And everyone says, we'll get another Honda plant or somebody to come in here. And I made a comment that day, they had this great breakfast. And it was eggs, and it was bacon, and it was dairy products. <laughs> Not one thing we ate that morning came from the state. It came on a Cisco truck, pulled up to the back. That is jobs. That food can be produced in this county. Yes, it's going to cost a little bit more, but when you're basically leaving your money in your county, I can tell you from experience, your county will benefit. Because if you go to Saks Ball, it's not going to be a $2 burger, it's going to be a $10 burger. But that hamburger came from Alamance County. But what, the, what we're going to do is fire back up this local food policy council and bring people throughout the county and hopefully support our county commissioners to show the value of agriculture. Because one thing I think we benefit, we talked earlier, maybe one of these two, we have some of the lowest taxes. You know, that's why we can have farming in Alamance County and not Orange County. So now let's understand the value of those farmers, support those farmers, because there is a lot of agriculture opportunities in this county. We just gotta connect them to the universities, to the hospitals, to the restaurants, the food stores, that is jobs. One last thing is totally change the subject. I'd like to go back for, for these folks is how can we, these counties around us, or I would say uh, Raleigh just got it, I think Durham's get it, they're making the jump to uh, uh, fire rockets. Google's coming in. Is there anything that the university can do partnering with the county, partnering with the city, and bring that in ourselves? Can we bring high speed internet here ourselves? and not wait for Google. I don't know, I'm just asking the question and he has the answer there. But that would go along in addressing how do we support technology in this community and the major's community to bring it here and not wait for Google to do it because I said, we're gonna be low on the list when they start looking at early for Alamance County. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know how we can jump that and bring it here? Is that a legislature concern? A legislature concern at the state level? I, I, I would say that is a, a market-driven thing. I mean, Google's not going to small towns. It's going to bigger centers to get started, to create those fiber hoods, they call them. Um, so I think it's a, a numbers game, really, which doesn't go along well with, you know, the food to, directly to table that you're talking about. But um, can we do it? I, you know, it's, it's money. It, that's, that's very expensive infrastructure there. So it seems like I've heard maybe on NPR today that places like Chattanooga, mm -hmm. the municipality is stepping in and becoming the utility provider for the internet. So they're basically so I'm just wondering if there can be a partnership with the university mm -hmm. and our county and our city says we're gonna do it and then tell the search about the community. Again, I don't know much, I just bits and pieces, but well, my, do it ourselves yeah. wait for them. My thoughts, you know, there are a lot of cities across the state of North Carolina that are, are electric cities. They, they do provide electricity. They own all those poles, and Duke Energy doesn't. So those are the cities that are more likely to be able to pull that off quicker than, say, a Burlington or a Mebane or a Graham because we don't provide electric utilities. But um, 
Yes, I, I mean, I think there's always a collaboration for public-private partnership. It, it just, uh, for that, I, I think you'd have to be in Electric City. My name's Justin. I'm from Southern Maryland. I'm looking to stay in North Carolina, possibly Alamance after I graduate. Good. What is being done to keep graduates from places like Elon or even UNCG or UNC Chapel Hill to keep them in the Alamance County area as opposed to living in Chapel Hill or living in Durham or living in Greensboro? What is being done to keep us here as opposed to these other places closer to the cities? Um, I, I'll just jump in. Um, I can't say uh, there's anything. I'll, I'll go back to the making a community livable somewhere you want to you want to stay. Um, you know, uh, I've been in government of some type for 32 years now. I know I don't look that old, but um, and I've realized something that um, local government and that means county or municipal is really the last bastion of government that can do you good and you will see the results fairly quickly. And I would encourage all of you to, especially the people with wisdom and silver hair, to get involved in your local government. You've got a lot of voices out there speaking negative about it as if we're taxing everyone to death at the local level, and it is not true. We are low tax here. And if we would just, instead of looking at everything as an expense, look at it as an investment. Look at our schools as an investment. Look at incentives to attract a business that's gonna give 500 jobs to this area. Don't look at that incentive as an expense, it's an investment. And I can prove to every one of you it will pay dividends forever. So local government can really have a positive impact. I still believe in it after 32 years, more than ever. <laughs> so I would encourage you, run for office, show up at a county commissioner meeting, show up at a city council meeting, say something. Say what you believe, because there are a lot of voices saying things out there, and most of them or negative. And I don't, I don't think we need to apply a federal mentality to our local government because I know Bob Bird. I, can't, I, can't, I, know, I know where he lives, so just... <laughs> we can do some really good things at the local level. That's what Eric Henry was saying. Do it at the local level, let's do it here. But we gotta make some investments. And that might mean some money. I mean, Gosh, I, I gotta shut up. <laughs> I look at Elon University. I look at Leo Lambert out there, and, and he's been here. He must have been here at least 50 years because <laughs> it would have taken Mevin 100 years to do what he's done in Elon here. So Elon would be if I look back 15 years and see what's changed in Alamance County. We're talking about looking forward 15 years. Elon's one of the biggest things. The hospital. Those are the big things that have really changed in the last 15 years. And if you want evidence of the university's efforts to keep students here, um, if, if that's the right choice, look right out as you walk out the door at S uh, the Student Professional Development Center, the names of employers recruiting students here. And even just the downtown housing opportunities that both Burlington and Mebbin are trying to kind of attract the younger person that wants a smaller space that's walkable to businesses and to things. Um, as someone who graduated from Elon back when it was a college and lived in Mebbin mm -hmm. for quite some time in Burlington, I can tell you it's certainly not the same as the bigger cities where I've also lived, but it's certainly an opportunity to get your first job and to make those contacts with colleagues and to kind of establish yourself in a small safe place where everybody is going to know your name and get to know you and kind of root for you and be on your team so i would i would say give it a try before you look elsewhere look here thank you hi i'm colby i'm a senior at elon i want to thank you all for coming um so i sort of have a question for dr kirk and a response to your idea um, i'm interested in loy farms 10-year plan and if, I know that we have partnerships right now with community organizations to supply adequate food to food insecure populations through Campus Kitchen and Alley Churches and Burlington Nursing Home. But I'm sort of wondering in Loy Farm's 10-year plan, how involved can we be in strengthening those partnerships? 
And is there a potential for Loy Farm to be a hub for local farmers to sustain continued training, act as a demonstration farm, and potentially um, work with the elderly population in the community to work on community garden plot designs? Because that would strengthen all facets, I think, of an individual's health. And Colby, could you tell the audience about Loy Farm? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Loy Farm is Elon's university farm. Um, it's acting right now as a demonstration farm for environmental science and study students. So we use it as an ability, or I guess, um, an environmental system um, to analyze local food systems. We're working on a woodworking um, facility and basically allowing a lot of the environmental classes to engage in outdoor education. Um, so I'll answer with my head as environmental studies faculty, and you, you know as much as I do, so I'll applaud your efforts. A um, couple ideas, um, like I'll hire good people. And we have very good people in place, uh, new hires in our department, working closely with the great staff at the Kernodal Center, working with the Campus Kitchen, uh, elsewhere, really working on this. Um, our role as a university, we can produce, uh, but we can also help with the outreach role. And so there's a lot of initiatives of how do we not just connect our own farm to the community, but how can we facilitate uh, other farmers uh, and distribution networks. And so we have faculty just got a word of a new grant today to continue some of this uh, work in the, in the outreach. Important role in, in local food systems. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, is there anywhere that we can look at the 10-year plan to see how we can incorporate local farmers to, to sort of um, engage in trainings together at the demonstration farm? Because I know in my own experience, I've been able to engage with some local farmers, but there's definitely, I think, still a segregation. And I, I think as an environmental science student and someone that's really passionate about food systems, to have that ability to train alongside local farmers in the community would really strengthen Elon's um, relationship with the community. Right. Um, great point, and I will uh, follow up with uh, Jana McFall, who runs the Center for Environmental Studies Sounds that good. manages the farm, and Professor Moore. <laughs> One thing this yeah, conversation has pointed out, there is a whole multitude of various organizations in the community doing some really neat stuff, from the makers' movements to various things we have here, um, to the things in Mebane that I had not heard about before. We are almost out of time, so I'm going to give our panelists an opportunity really to answer one last open-ended question uh, before we wrap things up. And that question is, looking forward, 15 years from now, what's one thing or two things that we really need to be thinking about? What's one or two big things that maybe are not on our radar screens but are going to make an impact? You can take a moment to think about that. Mm -hmm. well, I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't point something out. <laughs> and so I think going back to the slides at the beginning and, and looking at our um, population, I don't know if it's hard it. for me to see from this angle, but I know I saw them earlier. And I guess I look around the room and I look at our panel and I look at those population um, breakdowns. And I guess I'd be remiss if we didn't address kind of the changing demographics of Alamance County and looking at leadership and looking at um, culture and looking at diversity and looking at equity and kind of that scope of kind of reducing the gaps and thinking of things in a different framework when it comes to who will be living here in the next 15 years and how that's going to look very different than it does today and even just who turned out today and who's on the panel and kind of embracing that in a way where everyone feels um, supported and safe and that sort of thing. So that's what comes to mind first as we try to wrap up is that's one piece we didn't really touch on tonight. But One thing that's very clear from Ryan's projections from the Census Bureau is that this will be a more diverse community mm -hmm. in 15 years in a number of different ways, not just racial diversity, but linguistic diversity, mm -hmm. as well as potentially some economic diversity. So that's my answer, I guess, is that we should kind of look to that now and start kind of working on those things a little bit more intentionally. So, uh, so I'll follow up on that. Um, as a geographer, think of the geographic context, and, and Alamance is in a great spot. Uh, if you think we're, we are connected in so many different ways, uh, our natural resources are abundant, most notably our really strong water resources, thanks to some of our... Uh, for bears who, uh, who protected those resources for us. Uh, um, we're part of one of the biggest uh, growth regions in the United States that is in the Piedmont area. So the, the foundation is really strong. And, and to follow up on this idea, uh, um, 
the hard part's the, the community. We want livable communities, quality of life. Um, that seems to be the goal that we talk about, bringing economic development and having the discussion of how do we continue to grow uh, and strengthen our community. Um, I, I would agree with that. Um, we have some um, development uh, potential in the East Burlington area, um, which is very badly needed. Um, I can't comment on it because it's not public information, but I think in 15 years you'll see that, that that side of the city is, is better, um, more jobs, more opportunities, and, and more food. There'll be less of a food desert on that side of the city. And I think that's a big issue. It's just growing food and health are becoming very, very important issues in the planning field. And that's something that we're going to have to consider more. I know they're in our comprehensive plan, and I plan to push those as much as I can because they are so important, and we have to uh, try to make the, the city more livable and more connected and so people can get out and they can get exercise and they can travel through other means of transportation than just the automobile. And that will make our population healthier and happier and hopefully um, grow us as a, a better place to live. Um, I haven't heard anything mentioned about one of our new big assets, and that's the Hall River Trail. The canoeing, um, the fact that the trail goes through these mission villages, uh, I think that's a, a nice asset for our coming up future as they make more and more pieces. Of the uh, the Mount to Sea Trail. Mm -hmm. That's an extremely uh, important asset that we have in this county and um, little underutilized. I think it needs uh, more publicity, more attention. Uh, because it is so valuable. Not, not every city has a, a, or county, has a, a major river flowing through it. Right, so, right, mm -hmm. right. And, and on the Mountains to Sea Trail. Right. So that, the tourism that relates from that trail um, could add a lot to this county as well. Elon students, spread the word about that. It's like five minutes from here. <laughs> Joe. What was the Pardon. question? Uh, the parting thought was just, what's something that we should be thinking about over the next 10 or 15 years? Um, one of the things I think is going to make a big difference in the community is um, Impact Alamance. I don't know if y'all have heard of that, but it's where um, when the hospital, Cone, and Alamance Regional merged, they created a foundation. Uh, they threw $54 million into it, and the earnings from that money is going to be used in the community. And right now, the vision uh, for Impact Alamance is focusing on the um, zero to 18-year-olds and getting our kids off to a good start. Healthy food, which we've heard a lot about tonight. Healthy, uh, good education, et cetera. So I, I think Impact Alamance is going to be a, a, a mover and a shaker in the next 15 years. Um, and then... Um, I, I always look back, when somebody asks me to look at the future, I always look back, and, and I look back at uh, the year 2000, and I was actually uh, working for the county then as county manager, and um, we were dealing with Y2K, and I bet some of these kids don't even know what Y2K <laughs> is. And I'm glad they don't. Yeah. So Y2K, and now we're walking around with this that is more powerful than the computers we were trying to protect from crashing because all these zeros were going to come up. Planes were going to fall out of the sky. So it, anyway, uh, m my prediction is um, it, if, if we'll, <laughs> this is so self-serving, it's, it's embarrassing, but <laughs> if we will believe in local government, And get this idea, I, I, I've, been, I've been low taxing you folks for years. Um, we don't have to have high tax rates in Alamance County if we keep attracting business, because business pays the freight as far as keeping tax rates down. So I would just encourage you again, uh, participate in local government, because I think there's a solution there for this county for, for, on the education front and on the jobs front, on the food front. Uh, it's not all local government, but it is local government working with you folks, with business, uh, and, and it can have a really direct impact. So 
Um, I'll be one of those silver hairs looking for a job later on, and I'm going to show up at the meetings because I know enough to, <laughs> to be dangerous, I guess. But. Maybe if our Elon students stay, they'll hire you. Exactly. <laughs> I would I would echo that. Please show up at the meetings. There are so many boards and commissions that you could serve on. That we're looking for for people to come and help. It's it's your community. Um, try to be a part of it. Help us. Along with that. I just had one question again. Can you address the state privilege license that helps to fund general funds and local government and what the legislature is doing? Yes, uh, the, the, the General Assembly uh, voted uh, last year to eliminate the privilege license uh, for cities effective uh, July 1, uh, 2015. It has varying impacts on different cities. It, but a privilege license is basically you pay 25 bucks to do business in the city, and so we're, we know you're doing business in the city. Or it may be 100, or it just depends on the type of business you're doing. For Mebane, uh we will lose about $100,000. Um, and it, the privilege license was not one of those things putting any business out of business. Um, so uh, the General Assembly has voted to do that, and we have to replace that revenue. A lot of times it has to be replaced with the only really uh, viable tax we have is, is property tax. So, it, and everybody hates property tax. So, um, that, I, is that what? Yeah, I, that, but I guess to help understand, we're, we're here um, in Parks and Recreation, you hear a lot, we're hearing a lot about um, quality of life, greenways, trails, and with livable communities. And that's like an important piece of the funding puzzle for us to get things done. Yeah. So I just wanted to make sure everybody kind of heard a little bit about that. So we are um, now out of time, and I don't want to, uh, to lie based on what's on this program, but we will have a reception of some snacks and just across the, uh, the next door over, across this wall. Here's my hope and my challenge to each of you as you go forward. T tell somebody what your, your hope is for Alamance County in 2030. What's one thing you'd like to see different 15 years from now? Um, so hopefully you'll stick around and keep having conversations about these topics. Thank you again to our thank panelists. You. Thank you. And thank you. Thank <laughs> you.